Da. Recording in progress. Great. Um, yeah, because ultimately we don't have a future with, without nature. And sadly, nature does not have a voice without us. So we really need to be speaking up for nature where we can. And that is what UK Youth for Nature is all about. Um, but what about today? So with 70% of the UK land devoted to farmland and about 30 million gardeners across the country, which is quite a remarkable, staggering figure, there is a real opportunity here for us to protect and also restore our biodiversity in the UK. Um, and also there's the aspect of food. So food has this amazing spiritual um, and ecological significance that I think we've lost over the last few years. We've really lost that connection. Um, and yet at the same time, we all have to eat. So it kind of is the thing that unites us all as well. Um, and there are huge mental health benefits of not only growing, um, but also kind of being involved um, in kind of using and um, cultivating food. Um, but at the same time as that, access to land is incredibly hard to get handle, handle on. Um, and the situation really has never been more challenging for young people working in the sector um, and also to look to work in the sector. So this is the perfect opportunity for us to talk to a really wonderful group um, of gardeners and growers. Um, so let's get some introductions. Um, I literally made a note myself to record this, so that is good, I've done that. Um, but this evening, we're really, really fortunate to have George, who is also known as Green Fingered George, who is a young gardener and naturalist. We also have Balam Werner Gomez Baker, a biointensive veg grower, Khalil Radwan, uh, an organic halal regenerative farmer, and Sinead Fenton, who is a horticulturalist and grower. So I'm going to start with George. So George, why don't you go first and just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you actually got into gardening? Well, I think I've unmuted there. I'm not great with tech, so I'd, anything could happen with this, honestly. Um, so, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm George. Uh, I live in East Manchester, uh, kind of right on the edge of the city, really, uh, back in Unset Pennines. I live in a little terraced house. I've uh, got a pretty decent garden for the size of the house, really. Uh, my dad started working on that about, I don't know, maybe 17 years ago, kind of a start when I was start when I was born, but uh, when I was a, a baby. Um, and I kind of grew up with that as a project with my dad. Uh, and obviously as a young kid, I was just helping out with, you know, growing peas and starting off seedlings and that. And then as I've grown up a bit older and I've started to get more involved in it, I've been working on more of the landscaping side of it, um, making veg beds, uh, landscaping the pond, digging it all out, sculpting areas. Uh, and through that, I've, my interest in gardening has grown. But from a young age, I've always been interested in nature and birding birding in particular and you know we'd go off to not exactly far flung places but we'd go off to Liverpool uh, to the day estuary and uh, go birding on there but I kind of realised that you don't have to go off birding you can do it on your doorstep and by growing a healthy garden a very cute cat by the way that I've just seen in the corner I have to bring that up um uh, you know you can create a garden that's both great for wildlife but also one that you can literally just sit here and watch and it's cracking uh, so that's kind of how my my interest in gardening particularly is has, has grown from there thanks george um balam how did you get into biointensive veg growing um and actually maybe explain what that is for the audience because there's lots <laughs> lots of complex parts of what you say you do so talk us through that um, well biointensive uh and veg growing. I think the veg growing is self-explanatory, but the biointensive part is um, essentially we, instead of growing on a field scale, we have a very small garden and we use a lot of compost as uh, fertilizer um, for the soil and cram everything into a really small space and grow a wide variety of different vegetables. Um, how did I start doing this? Well, oh, that's a really deep philosophical question. <laughs> um, I, I guess I grew up in London, so I was surrounded by concrete and brick for most of my life. Um, I was very fortunate and privileged to have access to a small cottage in the southwest of France, which my grandparents bought and I spent every summer at. Um, and I guess that sort of started my love with nature. 
um, and sort of, I guess, growing up, I felt really disconnected and concerned with the world and concerned with how we've changed <laughs> from single cell organism to human destroying everything around us. Um, and I guess I found my way through nature. And to be honest, it's a long story and I won't bore you with it. But uh, I had a great experience of working on a few different farms. Um, when I had this realization, I must have been uh, 17, 18. And that was what, five years ago now. So yeah, since then, just working on different farms and finding my way. And that's where I am now, growing veg. Thank you. It sounds like such an um, interesting system, but also potentially a really attainable system as a biointensive veg kind of system um, for people who might not have that much space. So I'm really interested to talk about that later on. But Khalil, should we talk about organic halal regenerative farming? Because I really want to know how you got into it, because you you're literally sat in front of the house that you have constructed yourself. So <laughs> tell us all about what you do and how you got into it. Okay, but I warn you, um, if I uh, start um, going on too long, do stop me, because we've been here 20 years now. Uh, we started 2002, around September, we almost forgot our inception date, because it was a kind of real lifestyle change. My father was a lecturer at Oxford University for 10 years, so he had a lot of the theory, um, the academic side of farming, he'd done a lot of studies and uh, work with date farms and Arabic gum farms in the Middle East, Senegal, et cetera, in Africa. So he had done a lot of this impractical farming um, based on the study of the academic. Uh, at the same time, my mother had been studying reflexology, psychology, and holistic kind of um, remedies, uh, aromatherapy as well. So she was coming into the lifestyle of being um, holistic, looking at your whole uh, actions and your inputs into your body. My father was studying and uh, working with farmers, mainly on irrigation, so not quite English, but it does what you start. You start one uh, topic and you start looking at others. Um, and then add to that mix um, the lack of halal quality meat. Now, I will just divert here. Halal, we always hear about halal meaning halal meat, as in it's just something specifically to do with meat, uh, slaughter methods. Halal, to understand that, you must know what halal means. It's the Arabic word for acceptable. So if you think about it in that form, acceptable meat, what something we should all have, acceptable food. But specifically for food, because it can also be acceptable actions, charity is halal, good behavior, being kind, um, how you transact uh, with society, with banks, with um, finances. There's halal uh, behavior, acceptable behavior, and unacceptable behavior, which is haram. In terms of food, halal, is used with tayyib, which means wholesome. So for food to be acceptable, it must be wholesome, organic, natural. We can kind of all agree on this so far. It's when you break it down, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then for something to be tayyib and wholesome, it must be cared for, must be well nurtured, um, ethically and sustainably grown. So that's um, what we're looking for and what it should be. Obviously it's in the modern consumer world, it's just reduced to very much the basics, uh, the most simple kind of level you can sell it, package it and sell it because it's got to be manufactured, fast produced. So halal is kind of not really as it should be, at least 20 years ago, definitely. So we said, right, we're going to do it ourselves. So my dad and I was nine at the time um, with four other siblings. Um, no, sorry, three siblings at the time. The fifth one was born on the farm. Um, and we started a little egg delivery uh, in a pushchair. My, si my sister was two. So we put her in the pushchair, stuffed the pushchair with eggs, went around the local village, Bladen, where Winston Churchill is buried, um, Blenheim Palace, that kind of place. Small little English village, and we're delivering eggs around there. And then that was our prototype egg delivery business. 20 chickens in the garden. Next thing you know, dad's given up his cushy lecturers, Oxford University lecturing post and has bought 45 acres, uh, just about seven miles from Oxford Centre. Um, in fact, from the top of our hill, we can see the tree line of our old village. So we're actually within eye shot, eye distance of our old house. <clears throat> um, we started the egg business. From there, we had 3,000 chickens and um, we'd sold everything, 
moved to the farm, had a thousand pounds in the bank and were squatting on our farm initially in caravans. Dial forward five years, we got permission to live on our farm and it took us five years. I'm sure I'll touch on it later about the hardships and what we faced, but it took us five years to get permission to live on our land, um, which was a lot of issues with the neighbors. Um, we then progressed to doing meat hens. So we had eggs and meat and then sheep. And then we went to the farm locally to do beef. And then we just basically, as the farm has kind of developed and grown, families developed and grown, we've just become so connected to both sides that it's all one and the same now. So 20 years on, we've learned a lot of skills. We've really progressed from simple academics with the idea of how farming will be and how lovely and idyllic it will be to, oh no, no money, no clean clothes, nothing really in the way of possessions and rebuild the whole life. But we've changed that whole process. We've rebuilt our life in a new way and shaken everything up. That's amazing. I've heard uh, the term um, armchair farming. It's still going. Oh, you're, I got a bit of a Dalek vibe from you there, Kelly. I'm sorry. I think your connection is a little bit wibbly wobbly, but you're back. Um, yeah, I've heard the, the term armchair farming used quite a lot sometimes. Um, and it's very different to the on the ground stuff. Um, but speaking of on the ground stuff, Sinead, you've literally just come back from your plot. So talk us through how you became a horticulturist and a grower where you're growing right now. Yeah, hey, I am. Um, I'm Sinead. Um, I'm one half of Allside Farm, which is a small four and a half acre farm down in East Sussex. Um, basically, everything that Khalil said with what they were going through 20 years ago is my life now. I live in a caravan. I have no money. I um, never have any clean clothes because you can't wash clothes in a caravan in the winter. It's really hard. Um, so, yeah, hopefully in 20 years, I'll have a nice house like yours in the back there. Um, we'll see. But um, and then also, I guess my journey kind of really started a bit like um, Balham's and from East London. So, you know, concrete jungle. Um, and as a kid, I always yearned for like nature. I was very fortunate that my mum used to always take me to Epping Forest. We, you know, we didn't have a lot. We didn't have a lot of, we weren't able to like kind of get out and about too much. Um, but one thing that we did always do was, you know, get on the train to Hainal. And that really like kind of, sparked a love for nature it sparked a love for like wildlife um and eventually kind of like led me into doing like outdoorsy type of work um I actually started off um I guess my career as a geologist um as an exploration geologist um and more from like I love I love the idea of like everything around us is because of the ground um be it like if it's been grown or mined ended up going down a slippery slope of mining um because that's kind of what you do when you do geology um it's either that like mining or oil and gas quickly left that and realized that actually farming is basically mining but it has the added bonus of being able to turn it into a circle rather than just like a linear pathway um so I guess that's kind of how I got into farming it was like a love of geology and like rocks realizing that like the only thing I could really do within that space was a really destructive exploitative um not so great industry um and I didn't want to be part of that but I wanted to still be part of an industry that like you know you can grow amazing things so or like produce something amazing from the ground and that's what led me into um horticulture um and that really just started from volunteering at different community groups um London and like cities in general are like amazing spaces in terms of you there's lots of different like kind of growing patches you know there's like small groups that are doing things on rooftops there's people doing things in community centers there's people doing things at allotments there's a lot of like opportunity um, so I really immersed myself into lots of the different types of things that were going on and around in London ended up working or like volunteering at a community garden which then I eventually took on started running for a couple of years and then at that point kind of got a taste for this type of work and wanted to do it um as my job which at the same time the opportunity with the ecological land cooperative um came up to buy this patch of land that we're now on um, and that's through a mortgage scheme like because we ain't loaded I'm not yeah not from a wealthy background so it's uh, we put down a small deposit and then like we pay it off um, monthly. And what the Ecological Land Cooperative do is they buy patches of land that are really degraded. 
split it into um, small holdings and then sell them on to uh, punters like me that think that they can turn a terrible patch of heavy compacted clay flooded soil into a thriving business. We'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's me. I feel a real kinship with you when you talk about um, heavily impacted clay soils because it sent a sort of shudder through my entire yeah. body because that mm -hmm. is what I'm currently trying to tackle right now. Um, so I guess that takes us to, thank you so much guys, that takes us to our first question. So um, for me as a nature friendly flower farm, I guess, so our business is about growing flowers for people that brings them joy, but without any pesticides or any fungicides and basically finding ways to really encourage nature and sort of creating these like mosaics of habitats throughout this like two acre plot, whatever it might be. Um, so I, I'm really interested in like what ways you guys are engaging with nature in your kind of day to day lives and your gardens and your farm spaces. And why is that important to you and the kind of specific systems that you are operating in? Um, I might go um, to George again first. Do you want to come in and, and tell us about nature in your garden? Yeah, so. Um... Again, going back to what I was kind of saying earlier about how we you know for me it was kind of nature first, uh, birding that kind of got me into nature, and then from there, just kind of making that connection that I don't you don't have to drive off twitching upon some mountain up in Scotland. You can just step outside with some hot vimto and some jaffa cakes and sit on the wall and just see whatever flies by. I can be sat here now watching. There's a little pair of collared doves that used to nest up in the ash tree and they keep flying down and they're dead cute and lovely. They're a proper nice couple. Um, and you do get to know them on a, on a sort of personal basis. Like you get to know the characters. We've got the pair of collared doors. We've got the sort of gang of jackdaws that make a bloody racket in the morning and wake me up on the roof. Uh, we used to have a nut hatch that came in. He was always a character. And you get to know them and it's great. And then for me, um, on a kind of non-gardening basis, I recently kind of started kind of running up in the fields because I realised that I've got such an unhealthy lifestyle that I don't want to change but I probably should if I want to live for another 40 years so I decided I should probably should start running uh, so I started going up in the fields behind my house and um, I got really lucky and saw a barn owl and it was the first time I'd really seen one in the local area so I got dead excited but I thought it's amazing and then every time I went running about sort of eight or nine o'clock it'd be there and I'd always see it and I'd, I'd sat on this fence watching it and it'd land on the fence post, like further down from where I was sitting. And I'd just sit still thinking, I might get closer, I might get closer. And then eventually it flew a, a matter of maybe a couple of metres above my head. And it weren't bothered. It knew I was there. It must have known I was there. But it didn't care because it probably just didn't see me as a threat. And it was incredible. And then every night I've been out watching it. I still haven't come up with a name for it yet. I thought of Barney, but it's a bit cliche, isn't it? And, and I need to think of something better. Something Harry Potter related, definitely. Not Hedwig, but something along them lines. Um, watching it hunt for voles and things up in the fields and occasionally seeing deer, badgers. Um, it's just incredible. And it's it's in the local area. It's sort, of, it's sort of wildlife that 10 years ago, I'd have thought, I'd have to stay up till like the crack of dawn to see a badger or a barn owl or whatever. But I just go out just on my own will, walk the dog, go for a run, whatever. And I see them and they're there and I don't have to really sort of put in a massive amount of effort in. They're just on my doorstep and it's brilliant and then again yeah on a closer closer scale just sat here I can just sit and watch you know the wildlife that's come to me and knowing that you know nature is obviously its own thing it's its own mind and all that but a little bit of pride in the sense that I know that the work that me and my family have done to create a wildlife friendly garden has inevitably led to wildlife coming to us and it's really sort of reassuring and um, I suppose it makes you feel like you're doing some sort of like hand on action like you you know you see these massive stories about climate change and deforestation and it's obviously it's extremely concerning and you go on protests you sign petitions but obviously it's sort of such a massive scale it's difficult to do any proper sort of hand on direct action it's difficult because it's the planet it's the earth you can't just sort of well, you can go zooming about the earth if you want, but that would be hypocritical. I mean, again, it's a controversial issue, isn't it? but that doing just that and making a wildlife-friendly garden, making them small choices on your doorstep, does create direct action. It might only be like a, a, a 
absolute nanometer of the, the entire thing, the entire scale of it. But together, if you can then try and persuade and inspire other people to do that, then you've got a bigger scale. So it's the direct action that hopefully kind of dominoes into bigger action. Um, so that's for me how I'm sort of engaging uh, on my doorstep with, with nature. I love that. I think you're so spot on about direct action and the garden space that we grow in had absolutely no insect life, no bird life. And three or three, almost four years on, we've got a kestrel who's totally unbothered by the fact that we're there and she's permanently there. And we've got dogs. She doesn't even mind them. She's not frightened by them. And it's just like the most beautiful reminder of the fact that we're probably doing something right, at least, even if everything else is dying because of the drought. Um, so, yeah. What about you, Sinead? How, how do you kind of feel like your connection with nature kind of works with the work that you do on the farm? Yeah, I mean, I guess a bit like like George, um, you know, we came here with like the intention of um, nature first. Um, and I, I didn't actually say what we do. We grow flowers as well, uh, mostly like flowers. Um, and that was that's actually been like we started off as veg growers um, like five years ago, grew a few flowers. And then like there's a spark with flowers because you put a flower there. That is food. Insects will come. Wildlife will come. And it's just like that for us has been like the most amazing thing and which has eventually led us to this point now where we've decided actually you know what, what we want to do is just grow more flowers and provide more food for wildlife because if there's not enough food wildlife can't thrive and it's often a part that I feel is missing in the conversation of like um, biodiversity decline and the single most effective thing that you can do is just sow some flowers particularly things from the carrot family really effective um, but I guess like the land that we're on, so we're four and a half acres, we probably are growing on one and a half acres. Um, I guess the nature of what we're growing is it's cut and come again, so we can keep things in one spot and then we can cut it. A week later, things will be back. Um, so we don't need a huge amount of space to make enough income for the two of us. Um, and with that, that means that the rest of it, we've kind of just handed over to trying to do more kind of like conservation, regenerative work. So. This patch of land, four acres, is part of a wider 20 acre field with literally nothing on it whatsoever. Um, and the ecological reports that we came here to had said things that, like it was ecologically devoid, that the field wasn't able to support wildlife. But we are fortunate that we live in a space that has rich wildlife areas around it. So one side of the field, we've got a woodland. And then on the other side, uh, across the road, we've got a reservoir. Um, so what we wanted to do was to basically connect those two because we sit our field sits in the middle of that so we've put in two hedgerows which then connect that woodland to the space to the I guess the reservoir space to the west or north or east I don't know what side one side of us um, and we've planted an acre and a half woodland we're putting in a we've put in like lots of small ponds around the farm um, we've like altogether, I think we've planted like 5,000 trees um, in the last two years. And like the space is completely transformed. And luckily the nature of what we grow, which is flowers means that like there is a lot of food. Um, and when we first got here, we didn't really see anything or didn't really see a lot. And then within that first few months of being here, just having a few flowers dotted around here and there, literally we've seen like butterflies and leaving our like grass go long we saw we had nesting birds which haven't been here for a long time we had grass snakes we had um we've had like badgers coming up into the polytunnel um chasing us which is kind of like low-key really scary um but it wasn't chasing me so it was actually quite funny on my side uh, just watching it chase adam but um but yeah just like if you just put something there like wildlife will come like little ponds that we put in 20 acre field one pond frogs have found it how when around us there is nothing else so and I think that's really been for us like the kind of like hope of we really actually can do something and it doesn't actually take a lot of like it doesn't take a lot of time I think that was one of the things that we've been really surprised about is that in two years we have so much wildlife here now and it really hasn't taken I mean 
I say it hasn't taken a lot to do, it's taken a lot to do it. But really, like the principles is like we planted flowers, like it's not that hard. Um, and we, you know, we've been going through um, an ecological appraisal at the moment. And the guy that's like works around in the area said that he's seen more bees on this farm than he has in any of his visits over the last um, year, which is great but also really harrowing and really bad. Um, and I think the reason for that is because of our dense planting of like really nectar rich flowers. So things like chives, chai flowers are incredible. Borage, borage flowers, they refill their nectar every two seconds. So they are amazing for wildlife. Um, so yeah, that's, um, sorry, I get, get really passionate about like wildlife and just oh, go. It's the best. Forever. It's but, the um, best. but yeah, it is. And that's, that's why we've, you know, kind of chosen more now, if you know, let's go for the flowers. We live next door to a veg farm. So, you know, there's no point us also trying to grow, grow veg. We should just go and do the thing that one brings our heart joy, but also the thing that feels like it's making an actual impact during what is a really bad state um, at the moment. So yeah, that's kind of like where we, where we sit with everything. I think that's fab. And I love the point about connectivity, about joining up those habitats that kind of creating that mosaic. So, so important. And you talked a little bit about that slightly more intensive patch. So I guess that speaks to kind of what you're doing, Balam. Are you, do you find that um, in that kind of small intensive patch that you're finding a real increase in nature and how are you connecting to nature and how does that fit with the system that you are kind of growing on? I guess I'll talk about the system that we're growing on first in the space. I, I guess I didn't give much clarification with the previous question. So, um, um, uh, the main enterprises are uh, grass fed. Uh, we sell, gra well, the farmers, John T and Mel, sell grass fed beef and grass fed lamb, and they also do events and teepees and bell tents for where they host weddings and things like that. Um, the where I work um, is a small parcel of three acres within the farm and that's fenced off by deer fencing um, as what the business is is a for-profit business um, started by a friend of mine James um, who was an academic and uh, one day woke up and thought I don't want to do this anymore um, I want to grow veg for a living um, and so it has to make money essentially. Um, so in this small space, we the kind of it the the driving factor of everything we do here is um, to make money, which honestly is is actually driving me to leave here. <laughs> um, I it, it's not just that, but it's other things. Um, and maybe we can talk about that later but if i talk about the space before it was half of it was pony paddocks and half of it was sort of diverse wildflowers which were used for grazing um i must say overgrazing, not holistically managed grazing or more grazing or anything like that um but let's talk about the transformation of the place uh so where we are aren't growing bed uh, vegetables where the grass has grown um, and let to flower and express its physiology is just incredible insect life here. Um, and it's just incredible to behold, um, especially in, in, in the spring and early summer. Uh, and where we are growing vegetables, the way that we've brought the land into cultivation has been using well-rotted horse manure and hay and uh, green waste compost. Now, Manure and well-rotted manure is an incredible source of fertility and microorganisms to kickstart life in the soil if it has been dead or to give it uh, more food for the rest of the microorganisms and other organisms living in the soil. Um, the green waste compost is dead carbon, essentially. It's got no life in it and it's actually got some plastic in it, which is... Oh. Um, but as a means to make money and a means to... to um, grow vegetables fast and and be able to make a profit on a small space with an incredible workload uh we've used it um and i guess there's phthalates in the air that we breathe so we can't really escape it can we um 
and in the soil, it's actually been incredible to witness the change. So this is my second year working here and the change um, in the soil is incredible. The topsoil has turned and integrated with the manure and the compost that we've put on top and it's become rich and dark and there's aggregates and worm casts and all different. It's just crawling with life. If you scratch your hand in the top of a bed, there you'll see you know, uh, dozens of insects. Um, it's amazing. Um, I guess how I connect with nature here, um, take a moment, take a breath, look around me. Um, I think it's important. I think one thing I'd really like to express, I think that's something that um, George was touching on is that you can do that anywhere. Um, and it's not just a internal experience, it's a full body experience and a full body connection to everything around. And um, yeah, I think that's really important taking time within nurturing the nature within to be able to really see the beauty that, that lies before us. Yeah. Yeah, I would really agree with that. I think it's very, very important to uh, to take a moment to, otherwise you miss so much. I mean, just in terms of insects and moths, and I get totally overexcited when I see some kind of moth caterpillar or whatever it's going to be. It's just like totally overexcited. And to, to really appreciate that is, um, yeah, it's to take a moment. I think that's wonderful. Halil, what about you? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, what you're doing is is sounds, and the whole journey you've been on sounds absolutely incredible. But how about that connection to nature and kind of in what ways are you connecting to biodiversity and the work you're doing? Um, on the sort of things that you guys all touched on, I wish I could just interrupt and talk as well on or uh, vibe with you on because there's so many things you're saying, which I'm seeing. Um, you, uh, you spoke about the soil. When we moved here 20 years ago, it was a typical monoculture farm, um, barren grazing, but pesticide use. We've not sprayed pesticides and used anything in 20 years. And I remember the first couple of years was an explosion of life. As um, we were saying earlier, it grows back so quickly. Nature comes back as soon as you give it a chance, it's there. I mean, it's always there. But as soon as you give it a chance, it starts to heal and regrow. Like a smoker's lungs, when a smoker stops smoking within a week, he's healing but you've got to give it time to keep going. Um, and now we've had that, that you can't step, uh, you can't go a metre without seeing so much. So one way to connect with nature is just open your eyes, look around. As long as you're not literally surrounded by man-made structures. Um, we've got into foraging a lot recently, um, out of desire, who knows how the future will be. It might be out of necessity, but for desire and for fun, I homeschool my two children who are four and two with my wife, I won't take all the credit. Um, I'll take 20% of the credit, um, but sh we're into foraging and they and us have learned so much. You again, take a, take a step, walk a meter, and there's probably three plants around you that are either edible or medicinal. Um, even in towns where there's very little growth and nature, there is a lot if you actually slow down, look around. And then once you're looking, <clears throat> you can't stop seeing it. If ever you've looked for a, that old game where you look for a yellow car or a mini and you punch your friend, once you start looking for it, you see them everywhere. If you start looking for the owls and the badgers, <laughs> the spiders, the ants, they're everywhere around us. It's just we are so focused on our world, on our version of what the world should be. We've pushed and rejected nature and pushed it out of our spaces. Um, and we're realizing now how much we need it. We need the microorganisms in our food, sterile food, has a lot of problems. Vitamin D is in our soil. If you, if you wash your veg clinically, you don't get that vitamin D. Um, the mushrooms and the vegetables that are grown in these artificial environments are lacking in so much nutrition. And we're only now seeing how it's 50 years, 100 years later, having these major problems. And how do you undo that? You might not be able to. I mean, I'm not gonna say we can all fix it. It's, it is in a way quite a hopeless situation, but I think that shouldn't let us get down it's not about the results so much as the intention. In Islam, it's very heavy on your intention and less on your results. Uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't say the road to hell is paved with good intentions um, because those intentions are as much in a way as important as the result. So on the day of judgment, <clears throat> if the world is ending around you, you're meant to plant and you, hold, and you hold a seed, you're meant to plant it, even though it's the last day of the world and it makes no point. It's the action that's important. 
So we've really welcomed nature in intentionally and unintentionally into our lives. Being farmers it is as much unintentional that it ends up being there in a way. But we've tried to really, um, first and foremost, not use any chemicals. We try and farm in an ethical and sustainable way. So everything we do feeds into something else. Before we had our house, even plans drawn up for a house with, in the first year of the farm, we planted, I think, over 4,000 native woodland trees on the farm. 20 years on, this is our wood fuel for our heating. We have no heating without this. It's also providing cover for um, the sheep and the chickens. It's providing different flora and fauna. It's reducing rain loss, uh, water loss. So there are so many knock-on effects. You can't really say where nature starts and stops. As soon as you start it, you realize that every single thing, of course, is part of this wider tapestry. And if you try and remove one thing, everything starts to break down. So the solution is really to kind of create an enclosure around the chickens when the fox can't go, but allow him to enjoy the woodlands and everywhere else. Create an enclosure around your veg garden so there's no rabbits maybe, but you've got to really accept nature is there. Nature is life. And without it, there is no life. There is no control. There is no nothing left over. So you have to kind of accept, throw yourself at nature and get as much control as you can, but don't try and dominate. It's about being stewards on earth, being, in Islam we say Khalifa, being stewards, not the dominant force. We have the power to create so much and we have the power to destroy so much. So it's up to us how we behave. We are part of nature and we're judged on how we create that balance. I absolutely love that. And I have to say, these, <laughs> these answers are making me feel even more motivated. <clears throat> Well, it's been a very difficult year, I would say, for growers um, and farmers and, and gardeners in particular. A lot of people haven't been able to even use water during a drought, which has been, you know, it's very hard to watch a crop that you care about. And maybe you're growing for nature to die. So I actually want to, I really want to talk about that because it's 10 past seven and I want to make sure we've got time to ask any questions. Guys, make sure you're putting questions in the chat if you have anything you'd like to ask our amazing panellists. But I would love to hear about what barriers you faced into actually getting into what you've been doing or in your journey, um, particularly pursuing working alongside biodiversity and the works that you've been doing, but also how you overcame that, because I think that's a really important message that we need to sort of, you know, drill home that there, it is possible. It's not without its challenges, but it is possible. So I'd love to hear about that. Um, Sinead, I'm going to come to you first. Do you want to talk to us about barriers and opportunities for land <laughs> and access? <laughs> How long have you got? Because I've got like 99 problems and farming is all of them. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, um, challenges, barriers, where do I start? Um, I guess like the main challenge and barrier of like one getting into this work and starting to begin with was like accessing land and like having the ability to like to learn stuff. Um, you know, it's really hard starting out in this field if you don't have space that's like your own to be able to like, you know, grow in windowsills or your own garden, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, it, it's, I guess, what am I trying to say? Like, it's, it's quite difficult to get into this field basically without either taking unpaid work, which a lot of us don't have the luxury of being able to do, which then means that this field of work is only open to a certain section of society. Um, and that that was a big issue for us when or like for me when I was starting out that I was working or like volunteering lots for like free or like taking on unpaid work but then I would then have to work three other jobs to like make up for that time so burnout is you know kind of the biggest issue within kind of growing because to compensate for learning and taking that time out often we end up taking on other work which then puts us in like a tricky situation of like pushing ourselves too far. And then there's just burnout in general within growing, which, you know, kind of is a cycle that many growers kind of go through. Um, you know, this line of work is really, really intense from like kind of spring to, and summer. And then, you know, we start winding down in autumn, but it's very difficult to make sure that you've been checking in with yourself during those other times or like during that spring and summer so that when you come to the autumn and the winter you don't just you know kind of um find yourself in a really awful situation which in my six years of doing this job every year I've burnt out it just it just happens um and I'm trying actively very hard 
to make sure that that doesn't happen because that's not a life that I want for myself within this field of work that it's not okay to just let that be a thing um, and an accepted thing and often a celebrated thing within this space as well and it's not okay um, and that probably I guess like touches a little bit on some of the like kind of mental health type of side of this work um, but I, I guess this line of work like you're you're really exposed basically everything that I do is like the sky decides my fate every single day and today it decided to give me a frost five weeks early for four weeks ago it gave me a heat wave and everything died and everything's just come back and now it's died because of the frost like it's really hard to um I guess like let go of that sense of control because that's basically the world around us it tells us to control everything and this type of work is like surrendering yourself to the elements and then also learning to try and be okay with that but then you've got the anxiety of like right I gotta like run a business I gotta try and make some income to pay the mortgage on this place and you know it's it's really hard juggling those types of things and like making sure that you care for yourself because that a lot of us are drawn to this type of work because we're like we're searching for something and we're searching for that connection to nature and I, I hate using the word nature because like it it taps into like the separatist thing we're actually just trying to connect to something that we've been removed from a lot of us like when we come into this work but there is an element of this line of work when I guess your livelihood is brought into it that is really anxiety inducing of like so many things you can't control and the last two years last year we couldn't use a third of our space because it was underwater this year we had a drought what am I supposed to do with that information so it's it's really tricky to, I guess, like look after yourself through this. And like, we're getting better with it year on year of just, you know, we've got enough diversity within the farm and we've built in a lot of diversity into our growing to, so that if we do lose some stuff, the hit's not too bad. Um, and that's been, you know, yeah, trying to really put our business hats on for that. But yeah, it's, it's a really tough thing when your livelihood is like wrapped up in this type of work to, look after yourself and like make it make it work yeah I have nothing to add to that because everything you just said I completely agree with Sinead I really yeah absolutely feel that um George I I'm really interested in your um yeah your relationship with this and, and potential barriers for people getting involved in gardening because you know so many of us set out because we want to see more birds or more insects or whatever it might be in whatever space we have whether it's a windowsill or a larger plot or an allotment which take years to get on the list for so you know what are some bar barriers that maybe you've experienced or other people have experienced and might experience then how might we overcome those for for nature or for as you're right Sinead not for nature for finding that thing that we have been disconnected from there we go yeah, I think for me, <laughs> and it's an experience I think a lot of people kind of might agree with, is uh, my issue is people. I just don't like people. And no, it's not. Uh, but like what I've kind of noticed in the sort of, I, I, it's not exactly a barrier. It's more of just something that's kind of, I've noticed when I've been tripping about and that. Um, so for like birding, that, that side of things, a lot of the generation seems to be kind of older. And it's quite, it can be quite difficult to kind of sort of obviously make friendships through that, you know, with such a big age gap. And I think sometimes older, older generations can be quite sort of un, can be quite sort of condescending, not on purpose, just by the way they are. Like, you know, you speak to people, they go, oh, I, I remember when dodos were breeding on Minsmere and it's like, why do we need to know that? <laughs> and they try and rub it in and say that it's kind of, you know, kind of partly just like blame you for the way the world kind of is right now when it's kind of should be the opposite way around and we should be blaming you. But obviously you don't. But yeah, and then as regards to gardening, I think a lot of the, a lot of people that are interested in gardening tend to be quite posh. Like, <laughs> and quite posh and usually quite middle class. And for me, as someone who's Northern and, not exactly I'm not poor but I've, I'm from a working class sort of family it can be quite you know it's quite hard to relate to people who you sat, sat next to who are clearly like the lord and lady of Salisbury or something it's, 
and you, I, I was there once talking to these people, and I, I could tell you, you could just tell when people are posh and they have money, and you can you can just like smell it. I thought right, I'm just gonna have a little just have a little joke just for myself, for my own for my own amusement. So I you know, do you have a garden at home? And she went, um, yeah, so we have uh, about five gardeners at home, and I was like, oh, lovely, good for you. Um, and yeah, it can be quite sort of daunting, I think, trying to sort of speak to people who are interested in gardening when they, they're quite sort of, you know, you know, they've <laughs> got a bit of power and a bit of money. And it can be quite, for me, that's a sort of, of, of a barrier uh, in trying to sort of communicate with people. But you do find ways around it because you meet people that are like you. For me, with Bird and it was Indy, my mate Indy, who I met online and things, and he was a similar background to me and um, got on really well. Um, we're still mates and that and obviously we go bird and obviously do other things as well um but you do for the for the like 60 percent of the people that you don't get on with you know there'll be a 40 percent that you do um and you will find people that you like it can just be quite quite a struggle when you first kind of get into something and it, you know these people who are just nothing like you um but you do you know you, you find your way around it yeah, I think you're spot on. And also sharing sharing of that knowledge and making sure that it go it kind of comes down from generations so that you know how to grow. I mean, I've learned pretty much everything from my mum and from like other flower farmers who've been really will, willing to share their knowledge. But you've got to be part of that community to kind of get that knowledge and that can be a real barrier. Um, Khalil, I'm interested in, in barriers and stuff that you talked about before. Um, tell us about that and tell us about how you sort of overcame came those. So barriers for us are quite you know, similar to many others in many ways, because we're farming. But we also have a whole other aspect, and you can guess where I'm going this. We look very different to our local community. And to make it even funnier, our local community is a hamlet. So it's five families. Five English families with about two parents and one child, if that. So then here, here we come in, and our family of, uh, of now hen is half the population of the hamlet so we've done a real big change in demographically from white english christian to now 50 percent multicultural i mean you've got 50 muslims in the village it's great um but that was met with some prejudice and some jealousy part and part quite confused over where they're coming from themselves they're not quite sure if their anger is jealousy or racism or what so it was misdirected and um you can in your own time one time if you want to look at some good reading on the council website you can see all the applications we ever applied for for our farm and you can literally see the same four people writing their um, um, objections in and it's kind of comic if you take it in that kind of light-hearted comic way 10 years 20 years later because it was why are they having a swing how dare they have a swing on their farm we had two-year-old sister at the time my sister's two years old of course it's not a problem but it's not agricultural so we had they were complaining saying we should take it down and everything that we ever apply for be it something we need to apply for like maybe a shed uh, a, um, a stable or a barn that's rejected outright if it's something we didn't even need to apply for like a shed because we were naive we would apply putting applications after a few years you realize agricultural notice is also required just a notification, not necessarily application, but the council would reject it regardless. They'd reject everything they could. And it's because it was our neighbors complaining to the local council, the local council kicking up a bus, the next higher level, look at the paper going, I don't know what's going on. My friend here said they're bad, so reject it. We've had to fight tooth and nail, and it's really got to the point where it's comic, if you take it in a comic way. The most recent objection, and bear in mind, this is 20 years, of basically yearly or monthly applications every time we ever apply for 20 years on the most recent one was we started off this spring with an application for a goat shed and our neighbors complained and they were saying how messy our farm was and then they compared it to an asylum uh, camp uh, an immigration camp because it's messy brown people are there so and this is all on the paper and the funny thing is every time they do that we kind of take it on that water the duck's back, but because it's a racist element, the council then distance themselves. And it's actually been give them the rope to hang themselves because it 
coding what we're doing. So we just keep our head down, we apply, we go ahead, we do it, we do it, we move on. And we hopefully will get the rewards that our effort put in. Um, it's not always the case that your efforts will result in good rewards, but hopefully what goes around comes around. And um, yeah, we've managed to keep going from strength to strength by hard work. But there's been the social issues. Thankfully, Oxford is wonderful. Outside of the hamlets, Oxford is really green. Um, there's a really good farmer's market, which uh, started with us. In fact, my mother started it with um, another farmer, another black farmer, um, the only other black farmer in, in the area. Um, and that ran for at least 10, 15 years. There's another farmer's market we now also attend. So we've got really good lo local relations. And, and when we do have now a, a bit of a fuss with the neighbor and, and applications, we do a little whip round and they get six letters of objection. And then we dump them with like, I think it was 200 letters in approval. Um, and plan so it was like, I've never seen this. And we said, well, look, you poke the hornet's nest. We told our customers to write in. Now everyone's writing in. So um, we've got the support. And this is what I want to say as well. Community is so key. You will face so many struggles in life. And if you have no community, no family or no community around you, you lose knowledge, you lose support. You can't do everything yourself. That's a very modern um, idea where one business, umbrella business, has everything under one umbrella. In the old days, you had your butcher, your baker, your candlestick maker. Everyone in the village worked together and no one survived on their own. And you can't really, you can't live naturally and sustainably, traditionally, if you're going to try and do it all yourself. We've luckily been blessed with a family of 10, like I say, five of us are working on the farm full time, the other five are too young or too old. Um, and we've, we've dabbled in those things. So we are quite self-sufficient. We've got our own water source, our own electricity, our own heating. I was pointing at the boiler earlier, it got a bit cold so I came in. Um, our own waste management even, we're off grid, partly by choice, partly by, by where we are. So we've set up a lot of on, everything on our farm still trying to be as sustainable and ethical wherever we can from whatever we do. Like I say, energy, waste, all of these things we have to think about. Um, but because we've done a little bit of everything and there's enough of us, we're able to kind of keep that rolling in our own personal lives and not draw or cost it up in that way. But finances are important. You have to be financially stable. So our bread and butter is our meat sales. We've got uh, educational uh, aspects, visits. Uh, we work with a lot of different um, charities and interfaith groups. Uh, if you've heard of Lion, Land in Our Names, look at them. They had they held their inaugural meeting, their first meeting ever on the farm here, starting up here. So we try and have a lot of good community ties, and that brings in money through the charities um, to obviously run the events. Camping has been something that I've developed in the last three five, three to four years so that's another small income so the point is lots of little incomes to supplement your main income once you're at a sustainable level where you feel like that is ticking over that's it that's as far as we're chasing profits dad my father jokes we chase uh, the profit motives not the profit motive um the point is you want to live in a way that's sustainable but not in excess so once you've reached that point where you think, right, cool, that's all the land can bear, or right, cool, that's all that I can bear, then you really have to hold back and say, right, I'm done with that. What now brings me joy that will also hopefully cover its own cost or bring me maybe another source of income? Once you've set up maybe soap making, we'll then say, right, let's employ someone to make the soap. A little bit of profit can come off the top, and that goes back into the farm to create the next venture. And eventually, before you know it, you've got I've lost it. It'll get to the point where I can step back and just watch them spin. Oh, you're back. You're back. I got, I got you right at the end there. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you disappeared for a second. Your internet yeah. connection left us. I, I think, crikey, I mean, the, the way that you have been, yeah, pulled together all these opportunities and the way you just articulated what you did about um, making sure that when we talk about sustainability, it's, it's also about what we can cope with and what the land can cope with, I think is absolutely integral to this. And also to nature and biodiversity in, in itself, particularly around what the land can take. And for me, that is a really big thing. It's about making profit, but making profit just enough that you can live and pay rent and bills and maybe invest a little bit back into some more compost. But beyond that, I'm not sort of super interested in that. And I think 
you've articulated that beautifully. And I, I realise it's, it's 27 minutes past seven and I really want to give um, Balam a real uh, opportunity to talk about barriers and, and opportunities. Um, throw any questions you have in the chat if you've got some. Um, and then, yeah, so Balam, tell us about your barriers and opportunities because you wanted to mention that. Um. Where to start? Well, I guess the barriers that I think everyone faces are tend to be very nuanced to everyone's experience. Whether you have money or support from your family, or no support from your family, no money, um, uh, good health, not good health, whatever it is, and and and. and it, it, it can all be very nuanced. Um, I think something that I feel ties, uh, barriers that tie everyone together um, would be, I guess something that uh, Sinead touched on, which was the separation from nature and seeing nature as separate and how that has, um, for generations and generations and generations, purged us as a species and come to a point where our parents don't pick us up when we're crying, where the systems in place, uh, you know, where religion has has killed peasants, you know, has killed, murdered, you know, com committed genocide upon people who hold wisdom and love within themselves and connection to nature and um, systems where it's really hard to get out and actually, you know, do what you want to do and live your life with love, um, I guess. I've lost your sound. How about now? Is that better? Back? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I guess, yeah, that's been a real challenge for me is, is breaking through that conditioning of, of I feeling like I can't do things into opening myself up to thinking I can do things. Um, and I should. <laughs> um, like I come from a place of privilege, like my parents were working class, but like there was always food on the table and um, you know, there wasn't, and I don't have any abuse or anything like that. So I had a fairly good jumping ground to like a starting point to jump off to go to what I wanted to do. And I dropped out of school. I didn't want to um, partake in that. Um, and I was very lucky to find regenerative agriculture and I wanted to dive right into that. And I guess when I started my journey, I it was uh, it seemed limitless um and then i guess as i got into it i quickly realized that all the problems i thought i was like leaving behind all came with me <laughs> um and and no matter where i was it's the same things coming up um whether that was uh, addiction to substances or to my phone to or lack of i, I think something that um george touched on was lack of like uh, social, I don't know, like not not being able to access other people who are similar in age to myself, who think how I think and feel how I feel and care about the same things. Um, and I guess living this lifestyle of growing vegetables for a living is really like demanding. Like I'm always working, so I don't have time. I've got a young family, so uh, I don't have any time really for even myself and. I'm so challenging. It's really challenging. And, and to be honest, a lot of that is from decisions, poor decisions that I've made, um, not considering the whole and, I, and, and also coming from a place of maybe scarcity. So I guess when we were training um, at a farm in Worcestershire, we left there not really having a place to live. Um, and, and we we had to deal with that and, and we had to make decisions and, and it sort of forced us into where we were. Um, and really that was, that was, I guess, in reflection, that was uh, in our heads that we didn't have a place to live. I mean, really we did, we moved back with our parents and, um, and then were able to loan the money to get a, a shepherd's hut and bring that here as we thought it was the only place that we could be to work and do this kind of work. And in retrospection and introspection, I see that many people would, you know, do so much to have what we have and yet we're still not happy. 
company with what we have. And I guess that's um, that that what I'm I guess what I'm what I'm trying to to say is that uh, the main barriers that I think I've found are all internal and are all within and facing those and and sitting with them and realize and having time for introspection to to break past those and actually you see there's a whole world of opportunities out there the farmer here um john t he uh has got a very uh like main position at farm ed which is a agricultural uh, regenerative agro ecological educational center i don't really know but that's basically what it is and through him I see that there are so many people who want young people to come onto their farms. I mean, there are so many opportunities um, and it just takes the right people on the right at the right time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be right for anyone. Like right now, this place isn't really right for us. and We're going to have to move on from here onto something that sings truer to our hearts. But um, there are things out there. It just takes one to really break free of the constraints within themselves and actually sacrifice some things that maybe they thought they needed. For us, for example, we lived for two years without any money and, and on other people's land. So I guess I think um, Sinead was talking, you know, working for free and, and actually letting go of a lot of relationships and yeah, a lot of belongings and a lot of material stuff to, to go and pursue you know what we wanted to pursue and and now we're sacrificing a lot we don't have electricity i'm using my car light at the moment to <laughs> to um give you show you my my face um and we, you know we don't have electricity we don't have running water there are lots of things that i guess we're sacrificing to to live the life that we wish and and to a point that's you need to do that to get to where you want to be and, and i think understanding that wherever it is that you want to go to it's not the f goal that you're going to it's the journey and and i think sinead something she touched on was checking in with yourself always checking in with yourself um so yeah boundaries and opportunities there you are <laughs> i think you're spot on always checking in with yourself is, is totally right and i the real thing that i have taken away from this conversation has been about community and, and kind of reaching out and making connections with people who are, you know, are either aligned with the things that you love and you care about or that you can learn from the things that you love or that they can teach you or share with you or just, you know, maintain a bit of a fire in your soul about something that you feel really passionate about. Um, I, it's, it's 25 to eight and I feel like we should bring this to an end as much as I'd like to keep having this conversation with you all because you're great, but um, at the same time, you all work very hard and so we should allow you to go and be free and relax. Um, there are some fantastic questions in the chat, which actually um, Sinead has been pretty much answering the whole way through. So um, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, one final question, I think, before I round up is um, there is a great question here from Tristan saying, I'm um, concerned burnout will discourage people from growing their own. Has anyone considered self-sustainable systems such as agroforestry with a perennial base as an alternative to annuals? And um, that is for reference just in something that we're really considering particularly after this year um and, and really thinking about how we can change our system i think Sinead you talked about that a little bit earlier as well but um Khalil I'd be interested in whether you've done that um if you keep it brief that would be great <laughs> thank you um burnout but that's a good one um my father was 40 which I think is quite old to start farming at um but obviously having been an academic for uh, 10 years that did help give us a kickstart into the farm to make things at least uh, we're not renting we own the farm we had nothing else but we at least that stress wasn't there you didn't have to pay off anything everything with bill we burnt and um owned not had to give uh, not had to give back pay back that takes a lot of stress off um but burnout farming is uh you know the, the tropes of farmer swing from the rafters in the barn burnout it's since uh, the oldest profession in the world is farming and burnout has happened since then i think it's a lot of it is approach um there is always the factors outside of your control and this is where whatever you, coping mechanism you have be it religion or whatever um you have to hand over to that higher power that is nature that is out of your control you have no control and once you are able to accept that if you can accept with it 
as long as you can stick needs alive, your your food and your clothing are warmth, then hopefully you can survive it and weather the storm and take the good times and um, stockpile your food when you can, because the bad times will come. Um, so it's a lot of it is outlook and a lot of uh, burnout. And people who are positive have better luck. People who are negative have worse luck. And that's actually it's, um, it's on, look, if you're looking at the positives, you, see, you will see more negatives. So there's projection. So our cocoa is into the family. I've got two kids, as, um, as Beltham was saying, it's time to do my health. So I've basically said, right, that's how my life is for the next, well, four years ago, as I said, well, that's how it is for the next five years. I'm going to have no personal time. Anything I want to do, I do with my children. If I want to work, they're with me. I was just thinking of actually having my daughter come in because she's asking to come in right now and have her about say, sit here with me and you can just basically watch what we're doing. It's a learning opportunity for her. So I'm really proud of that. I'm therefore enjoying myself while being very useful, working, doing things I should be doing. And again, what you should be doing is your human construct and thought. Why are you doing these things? Is it for yourself? Is it for someone else? Is it the social pressures put upon you? So I think one way to avoid real burnout and stress is to accept the situation you're in, if you can, try and turn it to a positive so that it's no longer just accepting, you know, actually enjoying it. And um, well, I always look at my wants and my needs. Whatever I do in life, I do I want, do I need it? I shelve it for one and time and justify I it now or later and if I do need it now I will go and go buy it or build it or do it but it's that kind of pushing your own uh, ego aside looking at what's necessary for, you, for your lifestyle or the depend the society depends on what wants what's needs this main thing for me I think that's probably a very good place to bring this to an end because I think that the putting aside of your ego when you're farming or you're gardening, particularly if you're doing it for nature or biodiversity, is really, really important because it's about thinking about others and other, whatever that might be, whatever the other is, um, probably isn't even an other. Actually, it's probably, as Sinead pointed out earlier, on part of us, something that we're striving for. Anyway, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to all four of you because you've been amazing and it's been such a brilliant conversation. And thanks everyone for sticking around for an extra 10 minutes. Um, we've not lost a soul. I don't think so thank you so much um I just want to yeah basically say thank you for being part of Silent Spring at 60 um if you have loved this event we've got one more event tomorrow um which is at 5 p.m uh, on wildlife photography with the incredible Tony Rath who is a Belizean um professional nature photographer so that's going to be amazing thank you if you've come to any of our other events as well they've been fantastic um Ellen's put the 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 link to that in the chat um, and join UK Youth for Nature if you feel passionately about any of the things we've talked about. Um, feel free to drop us a line, follow us on Twitter and TikTok and Instagram. Um, all the links will be in the chat in a moment. Uh, and just a huge thank you for everyone's involvement and thanks for you guys coming along. It's been fantastic. Made me feel very motivated. So you're all wonderful. So Roisin, thank you so much for hosting us. You said it was your first time, but you've done an amazing job. Your questions have been really thoughtful and the way you bounced off everybody was fantastic. So thank you very much. As well. You're a natural. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're all wonderful. Let's all be friends. <laughs> Fab, thank you so much, everybody. And I, I hope you'll come to one of our events soon. I hope I'll meet you all in person soon. Fab. You're welcome to visit. No, oh, I, I will. Khalil, I'm serious. I'd really like to come. <laughs> I'm going to drop you an email. Bye, 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 bye. Bye. Um, thanks, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Love you.